The Nahum Goldman Museum of the Jewish Diaspora, situated on a hilltop in the heart of the campus of Tel Aviv University, was opened in 1978. The Jewish Diaspora Museum is a unique institution in the Jewish world, which is intended to fulfill two main purposes. The first is to create a living monument to Jewish life over 2,500 years of the diaspora. The second purpose is to serve as a bridge between Jewish communities and to augment knowledge and understanding concerning the history and life of the Jewish diaspora. The Diaspora Museum depicts Jewish life at different periods and in various parts of the world, stressing Jewish creativity and spiritual values. Almost all the exhibited objects are not authentic, but rather the work of contemporary artists and craftsmen. Yet, every item is faithful to the historic facts. The exhibition is organized in six thematic sections representing the main aspects of Jewish existence in the diaspora. A seventh section, the Chronosphere, presents an audiovisual survey of the history of the diaspora. Every year about 400,000 visitors come to the diaspora museum, Jews and non-Jews, tourists and Israelis, adults and youngsters. They come to see, to learn, and to understand. At the entrance to the exhibit is a floor made of Jerusalem stone, symbolizing the destruction of Jerusalem and the beginning of the journey into exile. A reproduction of the relief on the Arch of Titus in Rome shows Roman soldiers in a victory procession after conquering Jerusalem. The Romans thought that the exile of the Jews would mean the end of the Jewish people. But what they thought was the end proved to be a new beginning. The loot removed from the temple included the candelabrum, carried by the Roman soldiers in their victory procession. This candelabrum has become the symbol of renewed Jewish nationhood. How did the Jews survive, scattered among the nations of the world? These Jews do not share any physical resemblance. What have they in common which enabled them to survive? while other mighty peoples disappeared from history? The answer to this question is our subject. The family section, the first of six sections, illustrates the common aspects of Jewish life. Within the framework of the family, the Jewish way of life is realized. It starts with circumcision, symbolizing the covenant of God with the patriarch Abraham. When the child is still very small, the family makes certain that he begins to study. Study is considered by Jews to be of value for its own sake, a religious precept and an existential necessity. At the age of 13, the bar mitzvah ceremony is performed. From that time onward, the youngster bears full responsibility for fulfilling the religious precepts, the mitzvot, and he joins the Jewish community. The Jewish wedding combines a family and a religious celebration. The new family unit is responsible for the continuation of Jewish existence. More than the Jews having preserved the Sabbath, the Sabbath has preserved the Jews. The Sabbath is of supreme importance in the life of the Jewish family. Despite variations in different communities, the same significance of Jewish values and ceremonies remained. Holidays have a historical, a national, and a religious significance. For example, Passover is the holiday of springtime and the symbol of the nation's birth and liberation. The holidays retained their vitality because the Jewish family celebrants meticulously maintained both the ceremonies and the contents. The second section presents the Jewish community. The model of an Ashkenazi Jewish community in the Middle Ages shows the main components of such a community. The concern for education and the concern for religious and social services fulfilled a decisive role in the integration of the community and in its proficiency. The community was a vital necessity for spiritual and physical persistence. The exhibit contains three films about different communities. 
The first film is about the Jewish community in Fez, Morocco, which derived from Spanish Jewry. Polygamy was still practiced well into modern times. Another film depicts the community in Salonika, Greece, once numbering 65,000 Jews. The third film is about the shtetl in Eastern Europe, that small town, neither a city nor a village, but containing a whole world. spiritual joy and salvation through prayer. In the central expanse of the building stands a memorial column commemorating all the victims of persecution throughout diaspora history. The chronicles of the Jewish people overflow with suffering and persecution. The commandment to live through your wounds has accompanied this nation since it first made its appearance in the world. In each generation, the father tells his child, each of us must regard himself as having personally come out of Egypt, out of slavery. The path of suffering and the memory of resistance are commemorated in the book, Scrolls of Fire. The memorial column accompanies the visitor as he ascends from one level to the next. The third section, Faith, emphasizes the place of religious belief in the life of the individual and the community. Jews made their faith a way of life. In the house of worship, we see nine Jews awaiting the arrival of the tenth, who is needed for a prayer quorum, because the Jews' formal prayers take place in a group of at least ten men. The Torah was and remains the basis of Jewish existence. A people set out on a long journey and took nothing but the book. Ever since the destruction of the Second Temple, the synagogue has had immense importance for the Jewish people. The 22 models of synagogues in the exhibit symbolize this. The Jews invested their finest skills in the building of the synagogues. Only rarely did they paint human faces. One exception is on the walls of the synagogue Dura Europus in Syria, built in the year 245 CE, which were covered with fresco paintings whose style revealed the influence of the Roman, Greek, and Persian conquerors. Most of the drawings are based on stories from the Bible. The architecture of the synagogues was influenced by the surroundings and by special constraints of the environment. The synagogue in Toledo, built in the year 1200, is one of the most beautiful examples of Spanish Jewish architecture. The synagogue in Lutsk, Poland, was built like a fortress since it served as a shelter in time of trouble and as a defense against pogroms. It also helped the Poles against the Cossacks and Tatars. The synagogue in Vilna was part of a complex of buildings around an inner courtyard, the Schulhof. These buildings were a community center which contained many institutions, rabbinic academies, a library, and even workshops. The ceiling of the synagogue in Chodorov, Poland, was painted in the early 18th century. It is an example of an original Jewish folk art found in Eastern Europe. The paintings reflect beliefs, feelings, and ideas prevalent during that period, which was both a period of terror and a period of hope of redemption. In spite of differences in style and wealth, and despite the external variety in all the synagogues, they have in common all that relates to the sacred services held within. This synagogue in Toledo was built in 1357. The walls of the synagogue were beautifully decorated with foliate ornaments and stylized Hebrew letters. The house of worship honoring Rashi, added to the synagogue in Worms, Germany, has been faithfully reconstructed. Rashi was the greatest Talmudic interpreter of all time, as well as one of the great biblical exegetes. His influence was immense in medieval times and remains so to this day. This stone seat was called Rashi's chair. The yeshiva, the rabbinical school, performed an essential role for the Jewish people. A special film depicts the world and the daily life of the yeshivot.
In special study rooms, it is possible to choose from among approximately 100 films on different Jewish subjects. The Diaspora Museum produces and collects documentary films related to its subject matter. And they could not manage without them. And this is what sustains the... In the study rooms, with the assistance of a computer, the visitor can learn about the sources of Jewish family names. The computer also contains information on 4,000 Jewish communities. The information is screened and printed for the visitor. Dorot Generations is a special program which includes a computer bank of family trees. Visitors can feed in their family trees and eventually discover new relations between families. At the entrance to the section on culture, a scribe is absorbed in writing the scroll of the Torah. The scribe is a unique character among the Jewish people. Bent over his scrolls, he seems to be shouldering the burden of Jewish existence. The Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet and the Ten Commandments. The wall of the section on culture records 20 centuries of Jewish creativity. The colors express the varieties and the contrasts within modern civilization. In the past two centuries, the Jews have played a disproportionate role in modern culture and in all spheres of endeavor. It is not possible to understand the power of Jewish creativity without understanding the role played by the Bible, the oral law, and the precept of learning in Jewish life. The Bible has been translated into all the languages and many dialects in the world. It has retained its vitality and powerful influence over the peoples and religions of the world until this very day. The collage shows the faces of thinkers and famous Jews from all spheres of human creativity. Jewish scientists took a decisive role in creating the scientific outlook of the modern world. Jews provided the world with many philosophers and writers and an impressive percentage of Nobel Prize laureates. Jews made immense contributions to the peoples among whom they lived in all spheres and in all eras. The translation system installed in the exhibit enables the public to receive explanations in different languages. Hetzel in Basel during the first Zionist Congress appeared shortly after his death in the Hebrew Zionist newspaper Hatzfira, published in Poland. Education and knowledge have been central to Jewish life in all generations. Even in times of trouble and persecution, educational activity continued. The Jewish press reflects an entire Jewish world, and especially the ideological, national, and social trends in contemporary Jewry. The Jew would study the newspaper, just as his forefathers had studied their page of the Talmud. Pictures and ancient documents testify that even before the emancipation, and already in the Middle Ages, Jews were interested not only in religious subjects, but also made an important contribution to all areas of general knowledge. Modern Jewish creativity has been basically pluralistic, especially in the ideological, social, and political spheres. Before us, we have 21 thinkers who helped to inspire modern Jewish renewal. Jewish wandering is humorously represented by a typical history of Jewish families. After the generation of the grandparents in the shtetl, the small East European town, comes the generation of children who left the shtetl. What could have become of them? One thought that communism would save the world, as well as the Jewish people. And one found his way to the land of Israel. One decided to try his luck as a tailor in America. And one opened a shop in Warsaw. 
After many died in the Holocaust, Jewish wandering resumed. One grandchild found his way to the new left. One grandson became a student in California. One fought in Israel's War of Independence. A similar picture is shown of a family of Oriental background. The modern generation, which came after the traditional grandparents, integrated into modern life. One son was a government official in the British colonial regime in Iraq. One, a head of a local council in Israel. A daughter became the wife of a diamond merchant in Hong Kong. Another son became a rabbi in Mexico. One grandchild became a pilot in the Second World War. One, a doctor in Australia. Some remained in the diaspora. Some live in Israel. In the listening center for Jewish music, it is possible to listen to a large variety of Jewish music. The fifth section deals with Jewish life among the nations. This exhibit is about the life of the Jews in the countries of the diaspora and about their struggles to attain their rights and to preserve their uniqueness. The motto of this section is, I will not die, I will live. We start with Egypt. Jews had already reached Egypt long before the common era. In Alexandria, the Jews made the acquaintance of a great civilization outside their own land. They quickly adapted to the Hellenistic world. They were craftsmen and farmers, sailors and merchants. A workshop for dyeing cloth shows a craft in which Jewish craftsmen excelled. They spoke and dressed like the Greeks, but they retained their individuality, their faith and values. With the Roman conquest, the situation of the Jews in Egypt worsened. The Greek population was accorded more privileges by the Romans. Hoping to change the situation, the Jews sent a delegation to Rome, headed by the famous Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. When the mission failed, the Egyptian Jews revolted against Rome, but were eventually suppressed. With the failure of the rebellion, the grand and magnificent synagogue in Alexandria was burnt down. The Babylonian exile had already begun with the destruction of the first temple. The exhibit describes the period between the 3rd and 10th centuries. Many Jews were exiled, and later, others went to Babylon voluntarily settled, worked the land, and their community flourished. In many settlements, there was a Jewish majority. The head of the Babylonian community, the Exilarch, exercised considerable authority. He appointed judges and heads of rabbinical academies and spoke as the head of the Jewish community. The Exilarch was greatly respected by the sovereign ruler. His standing was further strengthened after the Arab conquest in the seventh century. Rav Ashi, head of the Surah Academy, began the redaction of the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud was the central spiritual creation of the Jews of Babylon. It is one of the fundamental possessions of Jewish culture of all times and has guided the practices of the Jewish individuals and community ever since. The judgments of the Academy heads in Babylon were accepted throughout the Jewish world. In the fourth century, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire after conquering the souls of the masses. The continued existence of Judaism embarrassed Christianity. Here in Antioch in Syria, Chrysostom, one of the fathers of the church, exhorts the public to enter the church and not the synagogue. Under pressure of the church, the emperor Justinian drastically reduced the rights of Jews, leading to their degradation. They were forbidden to study the oral law, to build new synagogues, to have Christian slaves, or to serve in the army. In the land of Israel, there was still a strong community 500 years after the destruction of the temple. The successive conquests of Jerusalem at the beginning of the seventh century by the Persians, by Byzantium, and finally by the Arabs, led to the virtual disappearance of the Jewish center in Jerusalem. In the 12th century, the Jews of Byzantium suffered humiliation, but were assured life and property. 
Benjamin of Tudela, the 12th century Spanish Jewish traveler, traversed the length of the Mediterranean shore and the Near East. The account of his travels contains much information regarding the Jewish communities he visited en route. The story of four captives tells of a group of scholars who were taken captive by pirates and sold as slaves. Emissaries of Jewish communities paid their ransoms and they founded centers for Torah study in Alexandria, Kairouan and Cordoba. The story hints at the transfer of the main Torah center from Babylon to Spain. A most important source of information concerning the life of the Jews in the Middle Ages is the Cairo Geniza, where tens of thousands of documents have been found. They include letters, contracts, accounts, and literary works. From the documents of the Geniza, it appears that religious and social ties between the scattered communities gave the Jews a great advantage in medieval trade routes. With the decline of the Jewish centers in the East, the European chapter in Jewish history began. Jews had already reached Spain during the period of the Roman Empire, but the golden age of the Jewish community in Spain commenced with its conquest by the Muslims in the seventh century. The flourishing of Spanish Jewry was unprecedented. Jews in Spain were great poets, outstanding doctors and writers. A Jew was an army commander, and there were Jewish advisors in royal courts. Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, or Maimonides, the greatest of the medieval Jewish philosophers, was born in Spain toward the end of the Golden Age. Most of his writings were in Arabic, using the Hebrew alphabet. He combined deep faith with far-reaching rationalism. After the Christians reconquered Spain from the Muslims, the status of the Jews was undermined. A religious disputation was held between the great rabbi Nachmanides and a monk in the presence of the king. Nachmanides emerged the victor, but he had to flee for his life to Eretz Israel. The situation of the Jews grew worse. In 1492, the Spanish king Ferdinand and his wife Queen Isabella expelled all the Jews who did not accept Christianity. Some converted, but many of these remained secret Jews. 200,000 emigrated and thousands perished. Thus ended a glorious chapter in Jewish history. Italy was one of the exile's destinations. There, the commercial and intellectual abilities of the Jews were looked upon favorably by their new neighbors. During the Renaissance and the period of humanism, many Jews prospered, but still they remained Jews. As previously, the church regarded this continuing obstinacy as intolerable. From the beginning of the 16th century, ghettos were instituted in Italy. The ghetto of Rome became one of the most adverse in Jewish history. Remnants from these ghettos are preserved until this day. The Ottoman Empire, with its spirit of tolerance, was another important destination for the Spanish exiles. They were received with open arms for their intellectual prowess and the capital which they brought with them. Also, their military knowledge was important for the expanding of the Ottoman Empire. A member of this successful community was the influential Jewess Doña Gracia, who organized an economic boycott against the port of Ancona, where Jews had been persecuted. Shabtai Tzvi was a member of this community. He presented himself as the Messiah. Eventually, he was arrested and converted to Islam. His false prophecy caused enormous despair to the Jewish people. Amsterdam was a further destination of the Spanish exiles. They quickly integrated into life in Holland and contributed much to the development of its commercial relations throughout the world, to the development of its financial market, and to the diamond industry. In 1672, the world's first Jewish newspaper appeared, the Gazette, written in Ladino, the Judeo-Spanish language. To this glorious community belonged the great Jewish philosopher, Baruch Spinoza. Impressed by the success of this community, and hoping for economic benefit, Oliver Cromwell permitted the Jews to return to England. In France and Germany, the history of Ashkenazic Jewry started. With the urbanization in the 10th century, Jewish abilities in trade and commerce were in demand. 
They were afforded privileges, and all vocations were open to them. But the church continued its persecutions. In the Middle Ages, Christians often placed two figures in front of their church. On the left, Ecclesia, symbol of the proud church, and alongside it, Synagoga, symbol of the blind Judaism. With the advent of the Crusades, the position of the Jews deteriorated. Incessant persecution, killing and expulsion. Jews were forced to wear a special hat or attach tags as a sign of contempt and humiliation. At the time of the Black Death, Jews were accused of being the cause of the plague and were burnt at the stake. In Paris, the books of the Talmud were condemned to the fire. Rabbi Meir of Rottenburg, a great rabbinic authority and the courageous leader of German Jewry, wrote a famous lament about the Talmud which was burned. A migration began toward Poland and Lithuania because of threats of expulsion and death. The Polish kings invited the Jews to come and develop the country. Jewish resourcefulness, commercial connections, and diligence were again in demand. The Jews were granted a large degree of autonomy. The Council of the Four Lands represented the Jewish community and enjoyed much authority. The intermediate standing of the Jews between the Polish landowners and the peasants created serious conflicts. The peasants regarded the Jew, who leased the land and collected taxes, as an ally of the hated Polish landowner. In 1648, a Cossack revolt broke out, aided by the Ukrainian peasants, against the Polish rulers. The Jews were the scapegoats and the chief victims. Tens of thousands were killed. Hundreds of communities were destroyed. The appearance of the false messiah Shabtai Tzvi was a reaction to the despair resulting from the persecutions. On the street in Lublin, we see a poster announcing the excommunication of Shabtai Tzvi. Subsequently, the Hasidic movement arose. The Hasidim considered religious experience of equal value to Talmud scholarship. While the Hasidic movement has since become divided into many courts, it retains its vitality until the present time. The vicissitudes of the modern era confronted the Jews with new dilemmas. The visitor faces seven dilemmas. What course would he choose? Where would it take him? At the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, many East European Jews migrated to America. Within several decades, American Jewry achieved cultural and material status and success. Yemenite Jewry always harbored expectations of imminent redemption, and this inspired individuals and groups to immigrate to the land of Israel. By 1948, one-third of this Jewish community had already moved to Israel. And after the War of Independence, most of the rest of Yemenite Jewry was brought to Israel in Operation Magic Carpet. The sixth section is the return. The return to the land of Israel. The longing to return to Zion was common to all Jews, in every generation and wherever they were scattered. And the sons will return to their land is the idea of returning to Zion. For Jews, the yearning for Zion was an expression of affinity and identification, or of the eternal longing for the Messiah. In the spirit of the words of Rabbi Nachman from Braslav, wherever I go, I am going to the land of Israel. The idea of the return is realized by immigrating to Israel, even though it entails hardship and suffering. At the end of a winding hall stands the candelabrum, symbol of Jewish sovereignty. This is the same candelabrum which the Romans plundered from the temple 1900 years ago. It became the symbol of Jewish renewal. The circle is now closed. The unique way of life of the family and the community, their resourcefulness and creativity in all spheres, their faith and spiritual values, and the perception of a common fate, as well as their important functions among the nations. All these have preserved the Jewish people, guaranteed its survival, and transformed it into an exceptional and inspiring phenomenon in the history of mankind.